Hello, and welcome to Kathy Reads. It's Friday, and you know what that means. That means Kathy uh, gets her ancient paperback books out of the hall closet. But no, she's using a Kindle. She has a Kindle, and on this Kindle is A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Originally published in a series of three magazines, and I don't remember the name of the magazine, but it was like 1914 when it was originally published and then compiled into a novel and published as a novel in 1917. 1917 is when Edgar Rice Burroughs was writing his John Carter of Mars, uh, his first John Carter of Mars book. I, until this this time right here, have never read any of the John Carter books, so I've been having fun with it. I was looking forward to it. I have a bunch of them on my Kindle, and they've been there for years, and I never got around to reading them, and now, now I get to read them, and you all get to join me as I read them out loud to you and to discover them for the first time myself. So that's, that is fun. I have had a lot of fun with it and I know some other people have had a lot of fun with it. Hey, Real Brush Guy, take me to your leader. Did you, did you remember to hit enter today? <laughs> Right as I said that. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, I'm amused. Maybe it's not funny, but... Maybe I'm just easily amused. So, it's all, it is, it's all about the perfect timing. You're on point today. Should we just start, or should we just let uh, let other people filter in? Or I have some Edgar Allan Poe sitting here too. We could always do a short Edgar Allan Poe as people filter in. It really, that is not a short one. Whatever this is, that's not short. Let's go back to the very beginning of this book. This is the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Volume 2, the Raven edition. We could read the Raven. Where is everybody? Says the real brush guy. I don't know. It's Friday. They're all outside enjoying the lovely weather, unless they're in Boston. In which case, it's raining cats and dogs, uh, or apparently it's raining in in Sweden too. So, does it does it rain cats and dogs, brush guy, in, in Germany? Hey, Asmo, everybody is packing. Oh, It's a raid. It's a just Dices raid. Dices, hello. Hello. Guten Abend. Wow, that was... <laughs> hello, welcome. I just started my stream like three minutes ago. Then surprise. <laughs> Nabend. I was just thinking of of reading a little short, you know, Edgar Allan Poe while I waited for people to kind of filter in. So, so Friday, Fridays are my reading streams. I read Pulp Fiction of the early 1900s out loud. Thank you, Agusaku. 
Remember, raiders, click on the live icon to refresh your view count. Thank you very much for that reminder. I always forget that. <laughs> I'm glad somebody here cares. Just Isis wants to hear stories. Hey, Captain Mizzy. We just had a raid, Captain Mizzy. Just Isis raided us. Can we get a shout out for Just Isis, please? Pretty please? If you're not following Just Isis, and I'm pretty sure every single person in this chat already is. <laughs> I'm, I'm like 99.5% certain that every single person in this chat right now is already following Just Isis. <laughs> because <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I've been reading the very first book in the John Carter of Mars series, which I've never read before, and it's fair use. So, so A Princess of Mars, originally published in uh, three issues of a magazine whose name I can't remember, uh, back in 1914 and then they compiled the issues into a novel and published it as a novel in 1917 so way back way back in 1917 John Carter went to Mars we're not sure how and uh, this is his first trip Lang, lang geleden, as they say in the Netherlands. Long, long ago. Yeah, in a galaxy that's not very far away. In fact, it's the same one we live in. Because Mars. In fact, it's the same solar system. We don't get out much. So we're on... Uh... Oh, I guess I should mention I also paint miniatures. I'm not used to being rated like right at the beginning of my stream. It kind of threw me a little. So yes, I do paint miniatures. <laughs> and uh, usually I'm doing that on, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then I stopped painting for Fridays because I like to stream or I like to read out loud to you. And uh, right now I'm painting some Reaper models. And like you know what? I can show you. I can show you. I think. Can I? I can. I can do this. I have this set up for this, I promise. Okay. Here sure, we'll we'll just put a we'll have a napkin as a backdrop here. That's that's professional, right? And my lighting is not the best right now because it's for me reading. Now for showing off models. So this is this is a bones model. See, you can tell because it's super bendy. Everything is bendy. Uh, and it's a work in progress. I have no idea what the name of the model is, but it's it's been fun. I I enjoy it. I like how she's floating. She's got like this little piece of material here, but she's floating. She's like a psionic, psychic. And then this one is metal. And I'm closer, closer to finish, but not, not quite. I still have a ways to go. And uh, we were exploring greens yesterday and finishing some highlights on her skin and messing around with the hair. And that is going to represent an air genasi. This one is not actually a Reaper miniature at all. This is a Raging Heroes model. Uh, it is a 3D print. Because Raging Heroes does 3D prints now and they're amazing. Uh, if you get the STL file, so much better than getting their own resin. 
Sorry, uh, Raging Heroes, but that's, that's how it is. And uh, that is, has been a really fun model to paint. The hair on the back is a little bit weird, but I don't care. I don't care. And then this little guy. I say little because it, I think this is an older sculpt. And the scale of it is, is true 28 millimeter, Whereas more recent Reaper models are... A slightly larger scale so everything else looks a little bit taller like 30 to 32 millimeter but this is a paladin and I was working on the metallic metals on this guy hey trouble you are just in time we have not started reading yet you didn't miss anything trouble but now I will I'll get rid of the other camera because we looked at miniatures. And now, hey, Fangwad. See, I knew that if I just wasted a little bit of time at the beginning. Fangwad says my Barsoom is ready. Wow. Off to Barsoom. We we're reading chapter 18. I thought we were on like 15 or 16, maybe 17, but no. We are on chapter 18. We could we could try to push to the end of the book today. We'll see how I feel as we approach 5 o'clock. Everybody's ready? Everybody's ready? I know Fangwad is ready. In trouble is ready. Saying what you missed last week's stream, but you caught the VOD. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, we missed you in the chat, Fangwad. I had questions, and I had no one. I had, to, I had to resort to asking other people to Google things for me instead of you. And I just kind of felt dirty. All right, chapter 18, Chained in Warhoon. Warhoon is spelled W-A-R-H-O-O-N, and to me that seems more like an Australian word. Like, Warhoon is somewhere in Australia. It sounds like it. All right. It must have been several hours before I regained consciousness. And I well remember the feeling of surprise which swept over me as I realized that I was not dead. I was lying among a pile of sleeping silks and furs in the corner of a small room, in which were several green warriors, and bending over me was an ancient and ugly female. As I opened my eyes, she turned to one of the warriors, saying, He will live, O Jed. "'Tis well," replied the one so addressed, rising and approaching my couch. "'He should render rare sport for the great games.' And now my eyes fell upon him. I saw that he was no Thark, for his ornaments and metal were not of that horde. He was a huge fellow, terribly scarred about the face and chest, and with one broken tusk and a missing ear. Strapped on either breast were human skulls, and depending from these, a number of dried human hands. Can we just pause with that imagery? And perhaps we can suppose that Games Workshop got this idea of putting skulls on everything directly from this book. <laughs> <laughs> Not breast hands. Skulls. Breast skulls. Oh, well, you're right. You're right. There were there are human hands depending from these skulls. So I guess they're they're like boob hands. 
It's like boob hammers, only, only the hands. Fangwad says, I feel like I missed something. Must have missed a stream after all. Oh, yeah, there was a lot going on in the last chapter. I mean, we did at least three, if not four chapters last time. And so, yeah, there was a lot. They are at, uh, what's his name? Jed, what's his name? Jed, Jed Clampett. They're at Jed Clampett's uh, camp, kingdom, city. Yeah, it's only without hammers. It's it's like boob hammers without the hammers. It's boob hands. Anyways, anyways, we digress. John Carter is always getting captured, so it's hardly unusual. Yeah, he tried to rescue the princess and and flee, but but they found out about it. Ooh, and we found out. We found out. But you don't. I don't remember anybody's name in this. I'm like the princess. The princess, not Princess Leia. Princess. Why can I not remember this? It was only a week ago that I was reading this book. Well, let's continue, shall we? Deja Thoris. I know, I know. Strapped on either breast were human skulls, and depending from these, a number of dried human hands. His reference to the great games of which I had heard so much while among the Tharks convinced me that I had but jumped from purgatory into Gehenna. After a few more words with the female, during which she assured him that I was now officially fit to travel, the Jed ordered that we mount and ride after the main column. Okay, so who's the Jed? Who's the Jed? Jed starts with an H. And all I can think of is haggis, and I know that's not right, because that's a completely different thing. Anyways. Someone to mount in. Everybody's mounting up. Everybody's riding in this trouble. It's like some sort of weird orgy. I was strapped securely to a wild and unmanageable thoat as I had ever seen, and with a mounted warrior on either side to prevent the beast from bolting, we rode forth at a furious pace in pursuit of the column. He was strapped on, Big Jim Slade. My wounds gave me but little pain, so wonderfully and rapidly had the applications and injections of the female exercised their therapeutic powers, and so deftly had she bound and plastered the injuries. Just before dark, we reached the main body of troops shortly after they had made camp for the night. I was immediately taken before the leader, who proved to be the Jeddak of the hordes of Warhoon. Like the Jed who had brought me, he was frightfully scarred and also decorated with the breastplate of human skulls and dried dead hands, which seemed to mark all the greater warriors among the Warhoons, as well as to indicate their awful ferocity, which greatly transcends even that of the Tharks. The Jeddak, Bar Comus, who was comparatively young, was the object of the fierce and jealous hatred of his old lieutenant, Doc Kova the Jed who had captured me, and I could not but note the almost studied efforts which the latter made to affront his superior. He entirely omitted the usual formal salutation as we entered the presence of the Jeddak, and as he pushed me roughly before the ruler, he exclaimed in a loud and menacing voice, I have brought a strange creature wearing the medal of a Thark, whom it is my pleasure to have battle with a wild thoat at the great games. He will die as Bar Comas, your Jeddak sees fit, if that is all, replied the young ruler with emphasis and dignity. If that all, roared Dakova, 
by the dead hands at my throat, but he shall die, Bar Comus. No maudlin weakness on your part shall save him. Oh, would that Warhoon were ruled by a real Juddak, rather than by a water-hearted weakling from whom even the old Dak Kova could tear the metal with his bare hands. Ooh. Ooh. Tough words. Hi, Misko. Misko is redeemed hydrate. Thank you for that. What is on my shirt? Misko asked. This is uh, Cthulhu. He's a Cthulhu. Hand painted with an airbrush by my friend Ray. Ray Van Tilburg, the artist. I also have a little painting of a Cthulhu that he did up on the wall. You can't, I'm pointing that way, it's up on the wall right there. I can look right at it anytime. It has a lot more eyes and mouths than this one, which is perfect. And that's why I got it. Ah, oh, yes, there on the wall, right there. <laughs> Rush Guy says, I'm actually a bit sad there was no VOD of your latest edition of Questionable Real Estate. Just, just push, rub salt in that wound. Rub salt in that wound. <laughs> Look, you he's crying, Big Jim Slade. It, it's so sad. It's so sad. Next time, next time we will all remind you collectively. So it looks like Doc Kova is kind of a a badass and a big giant meanie. And it looks like Bar Comas, the water hearted weakling, is is more like Sora, is that her name? <laughs> Snowyak says, Hiya, don't just talk. Don't don't talk, just read, let your eyes play around. Don't <laughs> That was the one That was the one thing we got from that stream. The uh, the Audrey Hepburn Adams, the Audrey Hepburn Wednesday Adams hybrid painting. It's from a song. Oh, it's from a song I don't know, I guess. That's okay. There are many songs I don't know. It is menacing. And she's right there next to your toilet watching you poop. Judging you. Watching you. <laughs> you just listening to a song right now, Snowyak? I'm just going to, yes, what brush guy said, who do I want snowy? We're reading, oh, we're reading A Princess of Mars, chapter 18 right now. Bar Comus eyed the defiant and insubordinate chieftain for an instant his expression one of haughty, fearless contempt and hate, and then, without drawing a weapon and without uttering a word, he hurled himself at the throat of his defamer. Ooh! Ooh! I never before had seen two green Martian warriors battle with nature's weapons, with the exhibition of animal ferocity which ensued, was as fearful a thing as the most disordered imagination could picture. They tore at each other's eyes and ears with their hands, and with their gleaming tusks repeatedly slashed and gored, until both were fairly cut to ribbons from head to foot. 
Barcomas had much the better of the battle, as he was stronger, quicker, and more intelligent. It soon seemed that the encounter was done, saving only the final death thrust when Barcoma slipped in, breaking away from a clinch. It was the one little opening that Doc Kova needed, and hurling himself at the body of his adversary. He buried his single mighty tusk in Barcoma's groin, and with a last powerful effort ripped the young Jeddak wide open, the full length of his body, the great tusk finally wedging in the bones of Barcomus's jaw. Victor and Vanquished rolled limp and lifeless upon the moss and huge mass of torn and bloody flesh. Barcomus was stone dead, and only the most Herculean efforts on the part of Doc Kovas' females saved him from the fate he deserved. Three days later he walked without assistance to the body of Barcomus, which, by custom, had not been moved from where it fell, and placing his foot upon the neck of his erstwhile ruler, he assumed the title of Jeddak of Waroon. Because of course he did. You couldn't have the nice guy. You couldn't have the nice guy be the ruler. This guy had to conquer him, so... Poor John Carter. It really is worse for him. Snowyak rode in a limo yesterday? Why? Fancy pants. Mizzy says, just got out of my car to leave work and I feel like I'm melting. Send help or shoot me. Um... Uh, I will send help in the form of a freeze gun. Pew, pew. A white limo to your daughter's graduation party. Oh, congratulations to your daughter. Mizzy, it's always an ice hug from the snow yak. He's all snowy. All right, so the bad guy became Jeddak of Warhoon. The dead Jeddak's hands and head were removed to be added to the ornaments of his conqueror, and then his women cremated what remained amid wild and terrible laughter. Ha 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 ha! The injuries to Doc Kova had delayed the march so greatly that it was decided to give up the expedition which was arrayed upon a small fart community in retaliation for the destruction of the incubator until after the great games and the entire body of warriors ten thousand in number turned back toward warhoon my introduction to these cruel and bloodthirsty people was but an index to the scenes i witnessed almost daily while with them they are a smaller horde than the Tharks, but much more ferocious. <clears throat> Not a day passed, but that some members of the various Warhoon communities met in deadly combat. I have seen as high as eight mortal duels within a single day. We reached the city of Warhoon after some three days' march, and I was immediately cast into a dungeon, and heavily changed to the floor and walls. Food was brought me at intervals, but owing to the utter darkness of the place, I do not know whether I lay there days or weeks or months. It was the most horrible experience of all my life, and that my mind did not give way to the terrors of that inky blackness has been a wonder to me ever since." The place was filled with creeping, crawling things, cold, sinuous bodies, passed over me when I lay down, and in the darkness I occasionally caught glimpses of gleaming, fiery eyes, fixed in horrible intentness upon me. No sound reached me from the world above, and no word would my jailer vouchsafe when my food was brought to me, although I at first bombarded him with questions. Finally, all the hatred and maniacal loathing for these awful creatures who had placed me in this horrible place was centered by my tottering reason upon this single emissary who represented to me the entire horde of Warhoons. I had noticed that he always advanced with his dim torch to where he could place the food within my reach, and as he stooped to place it upon the floor, his head 
was about on a level with my breast. So with the coming of a madman, I backed into the far corner of my cell when next I heard him approaching, and gathered a little slack of the great chain which held me. In my hand, I waited his coming. Crouching like some beast of prey. Oh, wow, that was a weird sentence. I feel like someone else is writing this chapter. It's very strange. I backed. Wow. This is a really long sentence. So, with the cunning of a madman, I backed into the far corner of my cell when next I heard him approaching and gathering a little slack of the great train which held, in, held me in my hand. What? What? I'm, this is what I'm reading here. It makes no sense. Does it make sense to you? I'll read it again. When I backed into the far corner of my cell when next I heard him approaching and gathering a little slack of the great chain which held me in my hand, I waited his coming. Crouching like some beast of prey. Like, okay, I understand it. He's crouching like a beast of prey with the chain in his hand and he has slack because he wants to leap at the guy. That's a really shitty sentence, though. It's it's really a not not a good sentence. Like you know what it means, Fang Wad. You know what it means, but it's terribly written, and it's difficult to read out loud because I feel like there should be commas and a period somewhere in the middle of that. Anyways. As he stooped to place my food upon the ground, I swung the chain above my head and crashed the links with all my strength upon his skull. Without a sound, he slipped to the floor stone dead. Good night, Snowyak. Sloplecker. Laughing and chattering like the idiot I was fast becoming. I fell upon his prostrate form, my fingers feeling for his dead throat. Presently they came in contact with a small chain at the end of which dangled a number of keys. The touch of my fingers on these keys brought back my reason with the suddenness of thought. No longer was I a gibbering idiot, but a sane, reasoning man with the means of escape within my very hands. As I was groping to remove the chain from about my victim's neck, I glanced up into the darkness to see six pairs of gleaming eyes fixed unwinking upon me. Slowly they approached, and slowly I shrank back from the awful horror of them. Back into my corner I crouched, holding my hands palms out before me, and stealthily on came the awful eyes until they reached the dead body at my feet. Then slowly they retreated, but this time with a strange grating sound, and finally they disappeared in some black and distant recess of my dungeon. Snowy, tell me, does that say I'm going to ride my bike on Sunday? Only in German? I don't know. Tell me in Dutch what that says. Write it in Dutch. I did it? <laughs> <laughs> wow, A plus for Kathy, not knowing German. I don't know German, but I know Snowyak. And he likes to bike. And I know Zontag is Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. 
Ik ga zondag weer een rondje fietsen. Ik ga zondag weer een rondje fietsen. I'm going biking again on Sunday. Biking around. Well, enjoy your biking. Find a fine pizza. I don't know. Anyways. I hope you have fun. And I can't actually speak Dutch, apparently. Can read it. Anyways, as I was groping to read, oh, we already read this. Am I already at the very end of the chapter? We did. The six eyes slowly approached, and then they. They reached the dead body, and then they retreated into the darkness and disappeared into the black and distant recesses of my dungeon. End chapter. Chapter 19. 19. Slowly, I regained my composure and finally essayed again to attempt to remove the keys from the dead body of my former jailer. But as I reached out into the darkness to locate it, I found to my horror that it was gone because, you dumbass, the thing dragged the body with it when it went back into the darkness. Then the truth flashed on me. The owners of those gleaming eyes had dragged my prize away from me to be devoured in their neighboring lair as they had been waiting for days, for weeks, for months through all this awful eternity of my imprisonment to drag my dead carcass to their feast. For two days no food was brought me, but then a new messenger appeared and my incarceration went on as before. But not again did I allow my reason to be submerged by the horror of my position. Shortly after this episode, another prisoner was brought in and chained near me. By the dim torchlight, I saw that he was a red Martian, and I could scarcely await the departure of his guards to address him. As their retreating footsteps died away in the distance, I called out softly the Martian word of greeting, Kaor. "'Who are you who speaks out of the darkness?' he answered. "'John Carter, a friend of the Red Men of Helium.' I am of helium, he said, but I do not recall your name. And then I told him my story, as I have written it here, omitting only any reference to my love for Dejah Thoris. He was much excited by the news of helium's princess, and seemed quite positive that she and Sola could easily have reached a point of safety from where they left me. He said that he knew the place well, because the defile through which the Warhoon warriors had passed when they discovered us was the only one ever used by them when marching to the south. Dejah Thoris and Sola entered the hills not five miles from a great waterway, and are now probably quite safe, he assured me. My fellow prisoner was Kantos Khan, a padwar, a lieutenant, in the navy of Helium. He had been a member of the ill-fated expedition which had fallen into the hands of the Tharks at the time of Dejah Thoris's capture, and which he briefly and he briefly related the events which followed the defeat of the battleships. Badly injured and only partially manned, they had limped slowly toward Helium. But while passing near the city of Zondaga, the capital of Helium's hereditary enemies among the red men of Barzoom, they had been attacked by a great body of war vessels, and all but the craft to which Kantos Khan belonged were either destroyed or captured. His vessel was chased for days by three of the Zodangan warships, and finally escaped during the darkness of a moonless night. 
thirty days after the capture of Dejah Thoris, or about the time of our coming to Thark, his vessel had reached Helium, with about ten survivors of the original crew of seven hundred officers and men. Immediately seven great fleets, each one of each of one hundred mighty warships had been dispatched to search for Dejah Thoris, and from these vessels two thousand smaller craft had been kept out continuously in futile search for the missing princess. Two green Martian communities had been wiped off the face of Barsoom by the avenging fleets, but no trace of Dejah Thoris had been found. They had been searching among the northern hordes, and only within the past few days had they extended their quest to the south. Kantos Khan had been de detailed to one of the small one-man flyers, and had the misfortune to be discovered by the Warhoons while exploring their city. The bravery and daring of the man won my greatest respect and admiration. Alone he had landed at the city's boundary, and on foot had penetrated to the buildings surrounding the plaza. For two days and nights he had explored their quarters and their dungeons, in search of his beloved princess, only to fall into the hands of a party of Warhoons, as he himself, as he was about to leave, after assuring himself that Dejah Thoris was not a captive there. During the period of our incarceration, Kantos Khan and I became well acquainted, and formed a warm personal friendship. A few days only elapsed, however, before we were dragged forth from our dungeon for the great games. We were conducted early one morning to the enormous amphitheater. Do you think they're going to make these two guys fight? I feel like that's where this is headed. Now that they're friends, they have to fight to the death. That's that's what I'm thinking. Let's find out. We were dragged forth from our dungeon for the great games. We were conducted early one morning to an enormous amphitheater, which instead of having been built upon the surface of the ground, was excavated below the surface. It had partially filled with debris, so that how large it had originally been was difficult to say. In its present condition, it held the entire 20,000 warhoons of the assembled hordes. The arena was immense, but extremely uneven and unkempt. Around it, the warhoons had piled building stone from some of the ruined edifices of the ancient city to prevent the animals and the captives from escaping into the audience and at each end had been constructed cages to hold them until their turns came to meet some horrible death upon the arena. Kantos Khan and I were confined together in one of the cages, in the others were wild Kalats, Thotes, mad Zitadars, green warriors and women of other hordes, and many strange and ferocious wild beasts of Barzoom, which I had never before seen. The din of their roaring, growling, and squealing was deafening, and the formidable appearance of any one of them was enough to make the stoutest heart feel grave forebodings. Kantos Khan explained to me that at the end of the day, one of these prisoners would gain freedom and the others would lie dead about the arena. The winners in the various contests of the day would be pitted against each other until only two remained alive, the victor and the last encounter being set free. whether animal or man. The following morning the cages would be filled with a new consignment of victims, and so on throughout the ten days of the games. Shortly after we had been caged, the amphitheater began to fill, and within an hour every available part of the seating space was occupied. Dot Kova and his jeds and chieftains sat at the center of one side of the arena upon a large raised platform. At a signal from Dotkova, the doors of two cages were thrown open, and a dozen green Martian females were driven to the center of the arena. Each was given a dagger, and then, at the far end, a pack of twelve kalots, or wild dogs, were loosed upon them. As the brutes, growling and foaming, rushed upon the almost defenseless women, I turned my head that I might not see the horrid sight. The yells and laughter of the green horde bore witness to the excellent quality of the sport, and when I turned back to the arena, as Kan 
Cantos Khan told me it was over, they saw three victorious Kalats snarling and growling over the bodies of their prey. The women had given a good account of themselves. Next a mad Zidadar was loosed among the remaining dogs, and so it went throughout the long, hot, horrible day. During the day I was pitted against first men and then beasts, but as I was armed with a long sword, and always outclassed my adversary in agility, and generally in strength as well, it proved but child's play for me. Time and again I won the applause of the bloodthirsty multitude, and toward the end there were cries that I be taken from the arena and be made a member of the hordes of Warhun. Finally there were but three of us left, a green warrior of some far northern horde, Kantos Khan, and myself. The other two were to battle, and then I to fight the conqueror for the liberty which was accorded the final winner. Kantos Khan had fought several times during the day, and like myself had always proven victorious, but occasionally by the smallest of margins, especially when pitted against the green warriors. I had little hope that he could best this giant adversary who had mowed down all before him during the day. The fellow towered nearly sixteen feet in height while Kantos Khan was some inches under six feet. As they advanced to meet one another, I saw for the first time a trick of Martian swordsmanship which centered Kantos Khan's every hope of victory and life on one cast of the dice, for as he came to within about twenty feet of the huge fellow, he threw his sword arm far behind him over his shoulder, and with a mighty sweep hurled his weapon point foremost at the green warrior, it flew true as an arrow, and piercing the poor devil's heart, laid him dead upon the arena. Kantos Khan and I were now pitted against each other, but as we approached to the encounter I whispered to him to prolong the battle until nearly dark, in the hope that we might find some means of escape. The horde evidently guessed that we had no hearts to fight each other, and so they howled in rage as neither of us placed a fatal thrust. Just as I saw the sudden coming of dark, I whispered to Kantos Khan to thrust his sword between my left arm and my body. As he did so, I staggered back, clasping the sword tightly with my arm, and thus fell to the ground with his weapon apparently protruding from my chest. Kantos Khan perceived my coup, and stepping quickly to my side, he placed his foot upon my neck, and withdrawing his sword from my body, gave me the final death blow through the neck which is supposed to sever the jugular vein, but in this instance the cold blade slipped harmlessly into the sand of the arena. In the darkness which had now fallen, none could tell but that he had really finished me. I whispered to him to go and claim his freedom, and then look for me in the hills east of the city, and so he left me. When the amphitheater had cleared, I crept stealthily to the top, and as the great excavation lay far from the plaza, and in an untenanted portion of the great dead city, I had little trouble in reaching the hills beyond. Chapter 20 In the Atmosphere Factory For two days I waited there for Kantos Khan, but as he did not come I started off on foot in a northwesterly direction, toward a point where he had told me lay the nearest waterway. My only food consisted of vegetable milk from the plants which gave so bounteously of this priceless fluid. Through two long weeks I wandered, stumbling through the nights, guided only by the stars and hiding during the days behind some protruding rock or among the occasional hills I traversed. Several times I was attacked by wild beasts, strange uncouth monstrosities that leaped upon me in the dark, so that I had ever to grasp my long sword in my hand that I might be ready for them. Usually my strange, newly acquired telepathic power warned me in ample time, but once I was down with vicious fangs at my jugular, and a hairy face pressed close to mine before I knew what I was even that I was even threatened. What manner of thing was upon me I did not know, but that it was large and heavy and many-legged, and I could feel, 
My hands were at its throat before the fangs had a chance to bury themselves in my neck, and slowly I forced the hairy face from me and closed my fingers vice-like upon its windpipe. Without sound we lay there, the beast exerting every effort to reach me with those awful fangs, and I straining to maintain my grip and choke the life from it as I kept it from my throat. Slowly my arms gave to the unequal struggle, and inch by inch the burning eyes and gleaming tusks of my antagonist crept toward me, until, as the hairy face touched mine again, I realized that all was over, and then a living mass of destruction sprang from the surrounding darkness, full upon the creature that held me pinioned to the ground. The two rolled, growling upon the moss, tearing and rending one another in a frightful manner, but it was soon over, and my preserver stood with lowered head above the throat of the dead thing which would have killed me. The nearer moon, hurtling suddenly above the horizon and lighting up the Barzumian scene, showed me that my preserver was Woola. But from whence he had come, or how found me, I was at a loss to know. That I was glad of his companionship, it is needless to say, but my pleasure at seeing him was tempered by anxiety as to the reason of his leaving Dejah Thoris. Only her death, I felt sure, could account for his absence from her, so faithful I knew him to be to my commands. By the light of the now brilliant moons, I saw that he was but a shadow of his former self, and as he turned from my carcass, <laughs> and as he turned from my caress and commenced greedily to devour the dead carcass at my feet, I realized that the poor fellow was more than half starved. I myself was in but little better plight, but I could not bring myself to eat the uncooked flesh, and I had no means of making a fire. When Woola had finished his meal, I again took up my weary and seemingly endless wandering in quest of the elusive waterway. At daybreak of the fifteenth day of my search, I was overjoyed to see the high trees that denoted the object of my search. About noon I dragged myself wearily to the portals of the huge building, and covered perhaps four square miles, and towered two hundred feet in the air. It showed no aperture in the mighty walls other than the tiny door at which I sank exhausted, nor was there any sign of life about it. I could find no bell or other means of making my presence known to the inmates of the place, unless a small round hole in the wall near the door was for that purpose. It was of about the bigness of a lead pencil, and thinking that it might be in the nature of a speaking tube, I put my mouth to it, and was about to call into it when a voice issued from it, asking me whom I might be, where from, and the nature of my errand. I explained that I had escaped from the war wounds and was dying of starvation and exhaustion. You wear the medal of a green warrior and are followed by a calot, yet you are of the figure of a red man, in color you are neither green nor red. In the name of the ninth day, what manner of creature are you? I am a friend of the red men of Barsoom, and I am starving. In the name of humanity, open to us, I replied. Presently the door commenced to recede before me until it had sunk into the wall fifty feet. Then it stopped and slid easily to the left, exposing a short, narrow corridor of concrete, at the further end of which was another door, similar in every respect to the one I had just passed. No one was in sight, yet immediately we passed the first door. It slid gently into place behind us and receded rapidly to its original position in the front wall of the building. As the door had slipped aside, I had noted its great thickness, fully twenty feet, and as it reached its place once more after closing behind us, great cylinders of steel had dropped from the ceiling behind it and fitted their lower ends into apertures countersunk in the floor. A second and third door receded before me and slipped to one side as the first. That is some crazy security. The second and third door receded before me and slipped to one side as the first before I reached a large inner chamber where I found food and drink set out upon a great stone table. A voice directed me to satisfy my hunger and to feed my calot, and while I was thus engaged my invisible host put me through a severe and searching cross-examination. I, 
I'm sure I could guess why it's so secure, but I shall read on. Your statements are most remarkable, said the voice on concluding its questioning, but you are evidently speaking the truth, and it is equally evident that you are not of the Parsum. I can tell that by the conformation of your brain and the strange location of your internal organs and the shape and size of your heart. Can you see through me? I exclaimed. Yes, I can see all but your thoughts, and were you a Barsoomian, I could read those. Then a door opened at the far right side of the chamber, and a strange, dried-up little mummy of a man came toward me. He wore but a single article of clothing or adornment, a small collar of gold from which depended upon his chest a great ornament as large as a dinner plate, set solid with huge diamonds, except for the exact center which was occupied by a strange stone, an inch in diameter that scintillated nine different and distinct rays, the seven colors of our earthly prism and two beautiful rays, which to me were new and nameless. I cannot describe them any more than you could describe red to a blind man. I only know that they were beautiful in the extreme. The old man sat and talked with me for hours, and the strangest part of our intercourse was that I could read his every thought while he could not fathom an iota from my mind unless I spoke. I did not apprise him of my ability to sense his mental operations, and thus I learned a great deal which proved of immense value to me later, and which I would never have known had he suspected my strange power, for the Martians have such perfect control of their mental machinery that they are able to direct their thoughts with absolute precision. The building in which I found myself contained the machinery which produces that artificial atmosphere which sustains life on Mars. The secret of the entire process hinges on the use of the ninth ray, one of the beautiful scintillations which I had noted emanating from the great stone in my host's diadem. This ray is separated from the other rays of the sun by means of finely adjusted instruments placed upon the roof of the huge building, three quarters of which is used for reservoirs in which the ninth ray is stored. This product is then treated electrically, or rather, certain proportions of refined electric vibrations are incorporated with it, and the result is then pumped to the five principal air centers of the planet, where, as it is released, contact with the ether of space transforms it into atmosphere. There is always sufficient reserve of the ninth ray stored in the great building to maintain the present Martian atmosphere for a thousand years, and the only fear, as my new friend told me, was that some accident might befall the pumping apparatus. He led me to an inner chamber where I beheld a battery of twenty radium pumps, any one of which was equal to the task of furnishing all Mars with the atmosphere compound. For eight hundred years, he told me, he had watched these pumps, which are used alternately a day each at a stretch, or a little over twenty-four hours in one half Earth hours. <coughs> Excuse me. He has one assistant who divides the watch with him, half a Martian year, about three hundred and forty-four of our days. Each of these men spend alone in this huge isolated planet. This huge isolated plant. Yeah, techno babble. It's it's like it's like Star Trek. I'm waiting for like tachyon emitters and you know all that. Every red Martian is taught during earliest childhood the principles of the manufacture of atmosphere, but only two at a time ever hold the secret of ingress to the great building, which, built as it is with walls a hundred and fifty feet thick, is absolutely unassailable, even the roof being guarded from assault by aircraft by a glass covering five feet thick. The only fear they entertain of attack is from the green Martians, or some demented red man, as all Barsoomians realize that the very existence of every form of life on Mars is dependent upon the in uninterrupted working of this plant. Fangwat says, you're waiting for John Carter to say it looks like some kind of energy field.
I am detecting tachyon particles. I don't know. That's a fair question, Big Jim Slay Gaming. But is it supple? I'm thinking no. I'm thinking not supple. Mm -mm. <laughs> Fangwad says, I'm sure you can ignore all this information John Carter is learning. It's definitely not going to be relevant later. Such a disappointing lack of supple on Mars. Yeah, it is. I think we've had one supple in this book. We didn't have any supple in Edgar Allan Poe. So... Where are we? Oh, every form of life on Mars is dependent on the uninterrupted work of this plant. One curious fact I discovered as I watched his thoughts was that the outer doors are manipulated by telepathic means. The locks are so finely adjusted that the doors are released by the action of a certain combination of thought waves. To experiment with my newfound toy, I thought to surprise him into revealing this combination, and so I asked him in a casual manner, how he had managed to unlock the massive doors for me from the inner chamber of the building. As quick as a flash, there leaped into his mind nine Martian sounds, but as quickly faded as he answered that this was a secret he must not divulge. So that right there just reminded me of that, that one episode of New Doctor Who where they're trying to get to... What are they... Are they were, were they lost in the TARDIS? I feel like they were lost in the TARDIS or something. And that's the one where you had to think about a bunch of different things. Like the scent of uh, Petrichor. And now everybody knows what Petrichor is, where none of us had ever heard that word before. <laughs> You remember that episode? I only saw that episode one time, so I only have a vague recollection of it. But I do remember the part where, you know, in order to get into whatever, she had to think of Petricor. And she's like, what's Petricor? Anyways, it's the same kind of lock. From then on, his manner toward me changed as though he feared that he had been surprised into divulging his great secret, and I read suspicion and fear in his looks and thoughts, though his words were still fair. Before I retired for the night, he promised to give me a letter to a nearby agricultural officer who would help me on my way to Zondaga, which he said was the nearest Martian city. Ooh, Zondaga, enemies of helium! but be sure that you do not let them know you are bound for helium as they are at war with that country. My assistant, my assistant and I are of no country. We belong to all Barsoom, and this talisman which we wear protects us in all lands, even among the green men, though we do not trust ourselves to their hands if we can avoid it, he said. And so, good night, my friend, he continued. May you have a long and restful sleep. Yes, a long sleep. And though he smiled pleasantly, I saw in his thoughts the wish that he had never admitted me, and then a picture of him standing over me in the night, with the swift thrust of a long dagger and the half-formed words, I am sorry, but it is for the best of Barzoom. As he closed the door of my chamber, behind him his thoughts were cut off from me, as was the sight of him, which seemed strange to me in my little knowledge of thought transference. What would I do? How could I escape through these mighty walls? Easily I could kill him now that I was warned, but once he was dead I could no more escape, and with the stopping of the machinery of the great plant I should die with all the other inhabitants of the planet, all even Dejah Thoris, were she not already dead. 
For the others, I did not give the snap of my finger, but the thought of Dejah Thoris drove from my mind all desire to kill my mistaken host. Cautiously, I opened the door of my apartment, and, followed by Wula, sought the inner of the great doors. A wild scheme had come to another wild scheme had come to him. I would attempt to force the great locks by the nine thought waves I had read in my host's mind. Creeping stealthily through corridor after corridor and down un and down winding runways, which turned hither and thither, I finally reached the great hall in which I had broken my long fast that morning. Nowhere had I seen my host, nor did I know where he kept himself by night. I was on the point of stepping boldly out into the room when a slight noise behind me warned me back into the shadows of a recess in the corridor. Dragging Woola after me, I crouched low in the darkness. Presently the old man passed close by me, and as he entered the dimly lighted chamber, which I had been about to pass through, I saw that he held a long thin dagger in his hand, and that he was sharpening it upon a stone. In his mind was the decision to inspect the radium pumps which would take about thirty minutes, and then return to my bedchamber and finish me. As he passed through the great hall and disappeared down the runway which led to the pump room, I stole stealthily from my hiding place and crossed to the great door, the inner of the three which stood between me and liberty. Concentrating my mind upon the massive lock, I hurled the nine thought waves against it. In breathless expectancy I waited, when finally the great door moved softly toward me and slid quietly to one side. One after the other, the remaining mighty portals opened at my command, and Woola and I stepped forth into the darkness, free, but little better off than we had been before, other than we had full stomachs. Hastening away from the shadows of the formidable pile, I made for the first crossroad, intending to strike the central turnpike as quickly as possible. This I reached about morning, and entering the first enclosure, I came... Entering the first enclosure I came to, I searched for some evidence of habitation. There were low, rambling buildings of concrete barred with heavy, impassable doors, and no amount of hammering and hallooing brought any response. Weary and exhausted from sleeplessness, I threw myself upon the ground, commanding Woola to stand guard. Some time later I was awakened by my by his frightful growlings, and opened my eyes to see three red Martians standing a short distance from us and covering me with their rifles. I am unarmed and no enemy, I hastened to explain. I have been a prisoner among the green men and am on my way to Zondaga. All I ask is food and rest for myself and my calat, and the proper directions for reaching my destination. They lowered their rifles, and advanced pleasantly toward me, placing their right hands upon my left shoulder, after the manner of their custom of salute, and asking me many questions about myself and my wanderings. They then took me to the house of one of them, which was only a short distance away. The buildings I had been hammering at in the early morning were occupied only by stock and farm produce, the house proper standing among a grove of enormous trees and like all red martian homes had been raised at night some forty or fifty feet from the ground on a large round metal shaft which slid up or down within a sleeve sunk in the ground and was operated by a tiny radium engine in the entrance hall of the building instead of bothering with bolts and bars for their dwellings the red martians simply run them up out of harm's way during the night they also have private means for lowering or raising them from the ground without, if they wish to go away and leave them. These brothers, with their wives and children, occupied three similar houses on this farm. They did no work themselves, being government officers in charge. The labor was performed by convicts, prisoners of war, delinquent debtors, and confirmed bachelors who were too poor to pay the high celibate tax which all Red Martian governments impose. The celibate tax. <whistles> they were the personification of cordiality and hospitality, and I spent several days with them, resting and recuperating from my long and arduous experiences. 
When they had heard my story, I omitted all reference to Deja Thoris and the old man of the atmosphere plant. They advised me to color my body to more nearly resemble their own race and then attempt to find employment in Zondanga, either in the army or the navy. The chances are small that your tale will be believed until after you have proven your trustworthiness and won friends among the higher nobles of the court. This you can most easily do through military service, as we are a warlike people on Barsoom, explained one of them, and save our richest favors for the fighting man. When I was ready to depart, they furnished me with a small domestic bull foat, such as is issued for saddle purposes by all Red Martians. The animal is about the size of a horse and quite gentle, but in color and shape an exact replica of his huge and fierce cousin of the wilds. The brothers had supplied me with a reddish oil in which I anointed my entire body, and one of them cut my hair, which had grown quite long in the prevailing fashion of the time. Square at the back and banged in front, so that I could have passed anywhere upon Barsoom as a full-fledged red Martian. My metal and ornaments were also renewed in the style of a Zondangan gentleman, attached to the house of Tor, which was the family name of my benefactors. They filled a little sack at my side with Zondangan money. The medium of exchange upon Mars is not dissimilar from our own, except that the coins are oval. Paper money is issued by individuals as they require it, and redeemed twice yearly. If a man issues more than he can redeem, the government pays his creditors in full, and the debtors work out the amount upon the farms or in mines, which are all owned by the government. This suits everybody except the debtor, as it has been a difficult thing to obtain sufficient voluntary labor to work the great isolated farm lands of Mars, stretching as they do like narrow ribbons from pole to pole, through wild stretches peopled by wild animals and wilder men. When I mentioned my inability to repay them for their kindness to me, they assured me that I would have ample opportunity if I lived long upon Barsoom, and bidding me farewell, they watched me until I was out of sight upon the broad white turnpike. Chapter 21 An Air Scout for Zondanga As I proceeded on my journey toward Zondanga, Many strange and interesting sights arrested my attention, and at the several farmhouses where I stopped I learned a number of new and instructive things concerning the methods and manners of Barsoom. The water which supplies the farms of Mars is collected in immense underground reservoirs at either pole from the melting ice caps and pumped through long conduits to the various populated centers. Along either side of these conduits, and extending their entire length, by the cultivated districts. These are divided into tracts of about the same size, each tract being under the supervision of one or more government officers. Instead of flooding the surface of the fields and thus wasting immense quantities of water by evaporation, the precious liquid is carried underground through a vast network of small pipes directly to the roots of the vegetation. The crops upon Mars are always uniform, for there are no droughts, no rains, no high winds, and no insects or destroying birds. On this trip I tasted the first meat I had eaten since leaving Earth, large juicy steaks and chops from the well-fed domestic animals of the farms. Also I enjoyed luscious fruits and vegetables, but not a single article of food which was exactly similar to anything on Earth. Every plant and flower and vegetable and animal had been so refined by ages of careful scientific cultivation and breeding that the like of them on earth dwindled into pale gray characterless nothingness by comparison. At a second stop I met some highly cultivated people of the noble class, and while in conversation we chanced to speak of helium. One of the older men had been there on a diplomatic mission several years before, and spoke with regret of the conditions which seemed destined ever to keep these two countries at war. Helium, he said, rightly boasts the most beautiful women of Barsoom, and of all her treasures the wondrous daughter of Maz, Mors Kajak Deja Thoris, is the most exquisite flower. Why, he added, the people really worship the ground she walks upon, and since her loss on that ill-starred expedition, all helium has been draped in mourning. 
that our rulers should have attacked the disabled fleet as it was returning to Helium was but another of his awful blunders, which I fear will sooner or later compel Zondanga to elevate a wiser man to his place. Even now, though, our victorious armies are surrounding Helium, the people of Zondanga are voicing their displeasure, for the war is not a popular one, since it is not based on right or justice. Our forces took advantage of the absence of the principal fleet of Helium on their search for the princess, and so we have been able to easily reduce the city to a sorry plight. It is said she will fall within the next few passages of the further moon. And what think you may have been the fate of the princess Dejah Thoris? I asked as casually as possible. She is dead, he answered. This much was learned from a green warrior recently captured by our forces in the south. She escaped from the hordes of Thark with a strange creature of another world, only to fall into the hands of the Warhoons. Their thoats were found wandering upon the sea bottom, and evidences of a bloody conflict were discovered nearby. While this information was in no way reassuring, neither was it at all conclusive proof of the death of Dejah Thoris, and so I determined to make every effort possible to reach Helium as quickly as I could, and carry to Tardos Moors such news of his granddaughter's possible whereabouts as lay in my power. Ten days after leaving the three Ptor brothers, I arrived in, at Zondanga, from the moment that I had come in contact with the red inhabitants of Mars, I had noticed that Woola drew a great amount of unwelcome attention to me, since the huge brute belonged to a species which is never domesticated by the red men. Were one to stroll down Broadway with a Numidian lion at his heels, the effect would be somewhat similar to that which I should have produced had I entered Zondanga with Woola very thought of parting with the faithful fellow caused me so great regret and genuine sorrow that I put it off until just before we arrived at the city's gates. But then, finally, it became imperative that we separate. Had nothing further than my own safety or pleasure been at stake, no argument could have prevailed upon me to turn away the one creature upon Barsoom that had never failed in a demonstration of affection and loyalty. But as I would willingly have offered my life in the service of her in search of whom I was about to challenge the unknown dangers of this, to me, mysterious city, I could not permit even Woola's life to threaten the success of my venture, much less his momentary happiness, for I doubted not he soon would forget me. And so I bade the poor beast an affectionate farewell, promising him, however, that if I came through my adventure in safety, that in some way I should find the means to search him out. He seemed to understand me fully. And then when I pointed back in the direction of Thark, he turned sorrowfully away, nor could I bear to watch him go, but resolutely set my face toward Zondanga, and with a touch of heart sickness approached her frowning walls. The letter I bore from them gained me immediate entrance to the vast walled city. It was still very early in the morning, and the streets were practically deserted. The residences raised high upon their metal columns resembled huge rookeries, while the uprights themselves presented the appearance of steel tree trunks. The shops, as a rule, were not raised from the ground, nor were their doors bolted or barred, since thievery is practically unknown upon Barsoom. Assassination is the ever-present fear of all Barsoomians, and for this reason alone their homes are raised high above the ground at night or in times of danger. The Ptor brothers had given me explicit directions for reaching the point of the city where I could find living accommodations and be near the offices of the government agents to whom they had given me letters. My way led to the central square or plaza, which is a characteristic of all Martian cities. The plaza of Zondanga covers a square mile and is bounded by the palaces of the Jeddak, the Jeds, and other members of the royalty and nobility of Zondanga, as well as by the principal public buildings, cafes, and shops. As I was crossing the great square, lost in wonder and admiration of the magnificent architecture and the gorgeous scarlet vegetation which carpeted the broad lawns, I discovered a red Martian walking briskly toward me from one of the avenues. 
He paid not the slightest attention to me, but as he came abreast I recognized him, and turning I placed my hand upon his shoulder, calling out, Kaor, Cantos, Can! Like lightning he wheeled, and before I could so much as lower my hand, the point of his long sword was at my breast. Who are you? he growled, and then, as a backward leap carried me fifty feet from his sword, he dropped the point to the ground and exclaimed, laughing, I do not need a better reply. There is but one man upon all Barsoom who can bounce like a rubber ball. By the mother of the further moon, John Carter, how came you here? And have you become a Darcine that you can change your color at will? You gave me a bad half-minute, my friend, he continued, after I had briefly outlined my adventures since parting with him in the arena at Warhoon. Were my name and city known to the Zondongans? I would shortly be sitting on the banks of the lost sea of Chorus with my revered and departed ancestors. I am here in the interest of Tardos Moore as Jeddak of Helium, to discover the whereabouts of Dejah Thoris, our princess. Sabthan, prince of Zodanga, has her hidden in the city and has fallen madly in love with her. His father, Than Kosis, Jeddak of Zondanga, has made her voluntary marriage to his son the price of peace between our countries but tardos moors will not accede to the demands and has sent word that he and his people would rather look upon the dead face of their princess than see her wed to any than her own choice and that personally he would prefer being engulfed in the ashes of a lost and burning helium to joining the metal of his house with that of Thas thancosis his reply was the deadliest affront he could have put upon the upon Thancosis and the Zondangans, but his people love him the more for it, and his strength in helium is greater today than ever. I have been here three days, continued Kantos Khan, but I have not yet found where Dejah Thoris is imprisoned. Today I join the Zondangan navy as an air scout, and I hope in this way to win the confidence of Sab Than, the prince who is commander of this division of the navy, and to thus learn the whereabouts of Dejah Thoris. I am glad that you are here, John Carter, for I know your loyalty to my princess, and two of us working together should be able to accomplish much. The plaza was now commencing to fill with people going and coming upon the daily activities of their duties. The shops were opening and the cafes filling with early morning patrons. Cantos Khan led me to one of these gorgeous eating places, where we were served entirely by mechanical apparatus. No hand touched the food from the time it entered the building in its raw state until it emerged hot and delicious upon the tables before the guests in response to the touching of tiny buttons to indicate their desires. That is some sweet fast food right there. We're headed in that direction. After our meal, Cantos can took me with him to the headquarters of the Air Scout Squadron, and introducing me to his superior, asked that I be enrolled as a member of the Corps. In accordance with custom, an examination was necessary, but Cantos Khan had told me to have no fear on this score, as he would attend to that part of the matter. He accomplished this by taking my order for examination to the examining officer, and representing himself as John Carter. That's very uncharacteristic of a Martian. They don't lie. This ruse will be discovered later, he cheerfully explained, when they check up my weights and measurements and other personal identification data. But it will be several months before this is done and our mission should be accomplished or have failed long before that time. The next few days were spent by Kantos Khan in teaching me the intricacies of flying and of repairing the dainty little contrivances which the Martians use for this purpose. The body of the one-man aircraft is about 16 feet long, 2 feet wide, and 3 inches thick, tapering to a point at each end. It's like a surfboard. The driver sits on top of this plane upon a seat constructed over the small noiseless radium engine which propels it. The medium of buoyancy is contained within the thin metal walls of the body and consists of the eighth Barzumian ray, or ray of propulsion. 
as it may be termed in view of its properties. This ray, like the ninth ray, is unknown on Earth, but the Martians have discovered that it is an inherent property of all light, no matter from what source it emanates. They have learned that it is the solar eighth ray which propels the light of the sun to the various planets, and that it is the individual eighth ray of each planet which reflects or propels the light thus obtained out into space once more. The solar eighth ray would be absorbed by the surface of Barsoom, but the Barsoomian eighth ray, which tends to propel light from Mars into space, is constantly streaming out from the planet, constituting a force of repulsion of gravity, which when confined is able to lift enormous weights from the surface of the ground. It is this ray which has enabled them to so perfect aviation that battleships far outweighing anything known upon Earth sail gracefully and lightly through the thin air of Barsoom as a toy balloon in the heavy atmosphere of Earth. Thank you, Misko. During the early years of the discovery of this ray, Many strange accidents occurred before the Martians learned to measure and control the wonderful power they had found. In one instance, some nine hundred years before, the first great battleship to be built with eighth ray reservoirs was stored with too great a quantity of the rays, and she had sailed up from helium with five hundred officers and men, never to return. And I see that Brush guy is redeemed stretch. So uh so we will stretch. We'll just we'll take a stretching break. Just take a stretching break. <sighs> stretch just can't get he can get up close. Can you look into the camera? Look into the camera stretch. Yeah, you don't get the focus on his eyes like you do with the other camera. <laughs> hey, ladies. <laughs> oh, this is what I needed. Needed a little stretch. All that all that sitting hunched there with the book. You know how it is when you're reading. Ah, <sighs> yeah, this feels good. Haha, <laughs> brush guy. That's much better. Thank you. So, yeah, the great ship sailed up from Helium with 500 officers and men never to return. They didn't quite have the... They didn't have the whole harnessing the eighth ray thing down yet. Her power of repulsion for the planet was so great that it had carried her far into space where she can be seen today by the aid of powerful telescopes hurtling through the heavens 10,000 miles from Mars, a tiny satellite that will thus encircle Barzoom to the end of time. The fourth day after my arrival at Zondanga, Zodanga, I made my first flight, and as a result of it, I won a promotion which included quarters in the palace of Thancosis. As I rose above, because of course he did, of course. He didn't know what he's doing. He just walks in. His first flight. Boom. Right in the prince's quarters. For as much time as this guy spends in captivity and dungeons and fearing for his life, he really leads a charmed life because when he's not in the dungeon, he's like, in the palace. 
Fang Hud says, John Carter is the best at everything, including getting caught. What's so confusing about the Yeah, he's like Conan that way. He's like Conan. He's gonna be king. Of course. As I rose above the city, I circled several times, as I had seen Kantos Khan do, and then throwing my engine into top speed, I raced at terrific velocity toward the south, following one of the great waterways which entered Zodanga from that direction. I had traversed perhaps two hundred miles in a little less than an hour when I descried far below me a party of three green warriors racing madly toward a small figure on foot, which seemed to be trying to reach the confines of one of the walled fields. Dropping my machine rapidly toward them and circling to the rear of the warriors, I soon saw that the object of their pursuit was a red Martian, wearing the medal of the scout squadron to which I was attached. A short distance away lay his tiny flyer, surrounded by the tools with which he had evidently been occupied in repairing some damage, when surprised by the green warriors. <laughs> They were now almost upon him, their flying mounts, charging down on the relatively puny figure at terrific speed, while the warriors leaned low to the right with their great metal-shod spears. Each seemed striving to be the first to impale the poor Zodangan, and in another moment his fate would have been sealed had it not been for my timely arrival. Driving my fleet aircraft at high speed directly behind the warriors, I soon overtook them, and without diminishing my speed, I rammed the prow of my little flyer between the shoulders of the nearest. The impact sufficient to have tore through inches of solid steel, hurled the fellow's headless body into the air over the head of his thoat, where it fell sprawling upon the moss. The mounts of the other two warriors turned squealing in terror and bolted in opposite directions. Reducing my speed, I circled and came to the ground at the feet of the astonished Zodangan. He was warm in his thanks for my timely aid, and promised that my day's work would bring the reward it merited, for it was none other than a cousin of the Jeddak of Zodanga whose life I had saved. We wasted no time in talk, as we knew that the warriors would surely return as soon as they had gained control of their mounts. Hastening to his damaged machine, we were bending every effort to finishing the needed repairs, and had almost completed them when we saw the two green monsters returning at top speed from opposite sides of us. When they had approached within a hundred yards, their thoats again became unmanageable and absolutely refused to advance further toward the aircraft which had frightened them. The warriors finally dismounted and, hobbling their animals, advanced toward us on foot with drawn longswords. I advanced to meet the larger, telling the Zodangan to do the best he could with the other, finishing my man with almost no effort, as had now, from much practice, become habitual with me. I hastened to return to my new acquaintance, whom I found indeed in desperate straits. He was wounded and down with his with the huge foot of his antagonist upon his throat and the great longsword raised to deal the final thrust, with a bound I cleared the fifty feet intervening between us, and with outstretched point drove my sword completely through the body of the green warrior. His sword fell harmlessly to the ground, and he sank limply upon the prostrate form of the Zodangan. A cursory examination of the latter revealed no mortal injuries, and after a brief rest he assured, asserted that he felt fit to attempt the return voyage. He would have to pilot his own craft, however, as these frail vessels are not intended to convey but a single person. Quickly completing the repairs, we rose together into the still cloudless Martian sky, and at great speed and without further mishap returned to Zondanga. As we neared the city, we discovered a mighty concourse of civilians and troops assembled upon the plain before the city. The sky was black with naval vessels and private and public pleasure craft, flying long streamers of gay-colored silks and banners and flags of odd and picturesque design. My companion signaled that I slow down, and, running his machine close beside mine, suggested that we approach and watch the ceremony, which, he said, was for the purpose of conferring honors on individual officers and men for bravery and other distinguished service. He then unfurled a little ensign, 
which denoted that his craft bore a member of the royal family of Zodanga, and together we made our way through the maze of low-lying air vessels until we hung directly over the jeddak of Zodanga and his staff. All were mounted upon the small domestic bull boats of the Red Martians, and their trappings and ornamentation bore such a quantity of gorgeous colored feathers that I could not but be struck with the startling resemblance the concourse bore to, the, to a band of the Red Indians of my own earth. One of the staff called the attention of Thancosis to the presence of my companion above them, and the ruler motioned for him to descend. As they waited for the troops to move into position, facing the Jeddak, the two talked earnestly together, the Jeddak and his staff occasionally glancing up at me. I could not hear their conversation, and presently it ceased and all dismounted, as the last body of troops had wheeled into position before the emperor. A member of the staff advanced toward the troops, and calling the name of a soldier, commanded him to advance. The officer then recited the nature of the heroic act which had won the approval of the Jeddak, and the latter advanced and placed a metal ornament upon the left arm of the lucky man. Ten men had been so decorated when the aide called out to John Carter, air scout. Never in my life had I been so surprised, but the habit of military discipline is strong within me, and I dropped my little machine lightly to the ground and advanced on foot, as I had seen the others do. As I halted before the officer, he addressed me in a voice audible to the entire assemblage of troops and spectators. In recognition, John Carter, he said, of your remarkable courage and skill in defending the person of the cousin of the Jeddak, Than Kosis, and, single-handed, vanquishing three green warriors, it is the pleasure of our Jeddak to confer on you the mark of his esteem. Than Kosis then advanced toward me and, placing an ornament upon me, said, my cousin has narrated the details of your wonderful achievement, which seems little short of miraculous, and if you can so well defend a cousin of the Jeddak, how much better could you defend the person of the Jeddak himself? You are therefore appointed a padawar of the guards, and will be quartered in my palace hereafter. I thanked him, and at the dire and his direction joined the members of his staff. After the ceremony, I returned my machine to its quarters on the roof of the barracks of the air scout squadron, and with an orderly from the palace to guide me, I reported to the officer in charge of the palace. How convenient! Chapter 22 Whoops. Chapter 22, I Find Deja. The major domo to whom I reported had been given instructions to station me near the person of the Jeddak, who, in time of war, is always in great danger of assassination. As the rule that all is fair in war seems to constitute the entire ethics of Martian conflict. He therefore escorted me immediately to the apartment in which Than Kosis then was. The ruler was engaged in conversation with his son Sabthan and several courtiers of his household, and did not perceive my entrance. The walls of the apartment were completely hung with splendid tapestries, which hid any window or doors which may have pierced them. The room was lighted by imprisoned rays of sunshine, held between the ceiling proper and what appeared to be a ground-glass false ceiling a few inches below. My guide drew aside one of the tapestries, disclosing a passage which encircled the room, between the hangings and the walls of the chamber. Within this passage, I was to remain, he said, so long as Than Kosis was in the apartment. When he left, I was to follow. My only duty was to guard the ruler and keep out of sight as much as possible. I would be relieved after a period of four hours. The majordomo then left me. The tapestries were of a strange weaving which gave the appearance of heavy solidity from one side, but from my hiding place I could perceive all that took place within the room as readily as though there had been no curtain intervening. Scarcely had I gained my post than the tapestry at the opposite end of the chamber separated, and four soldiers of the guard entered, surrounding a female figure. <laughs> right, Fanglod, background checks are overrated. Yeah, we'll just let anybody, 
Eh, we'll just let anybody in here. This guy, he killed some other guys. Just bring him in. He's fine. It's fine. The guard entered, surrounding a female figure. Who could it be? As they approached Than Kosis, the soldiers fell to either side, and there, standing before the Jeddak, and not ten feet from me, her beautiful face radiant with smiles, was Dejah Thoris. Wait, her face is, with, is radiant with smiles? Hmm. Sab Than, Prince of Zodanga, advanced to meet her, and hand in hand, they approached close to the Jeddak. Then Kosis looked up in surprise and, rising, saluted her. To what strange freak do I owe this visit from the Princess of Helium, who two days ago was rare consideration? Who two days ago, with rare consideration for my pride, assured me that she would prefer Tal Hajus, the green thark, to my son? Deja Thoris only smiled the more, and with the roguish dimples playing at the corners of her mouth, she made answer. From the beginning of time upon Barsoom, it has been the prerogative of women to change her mind as she listed and to dissemble in matters concerning her heart. That you will forgive, Thancosis, as has your son. Two days ago I was not sure of his love for me, but now I am and I have come to beg of you to forget my rash words and to accept the assurance of the Princess of Helium that when the time comes she will wed Sabathan, Prince of Zodanga. I am glad that you have so decided, replied Thancosis. It is far from my desire to push war further against the people of Helium, and your promise shall be recorded and a proclamation to my people issued forthwith. It were better, Thancosis interrupted Dejah Thoris, that the proclamation wait the ending of this war. It would look strange indeed to my people and to yours, were the Princess of Helium, to give herself to her country's enemy in the midst of hostilities. Cannot the war be ended at once, spoke Sabthan? It requires but the word of Thancosis to bring peace. Say it, my father, say the word that will hasten my happiness and end this unpopular strife. We shall see, replied Thancosis, how the people of Helium take to peace. I shall at least offer it to them. Dejah Thoris, after a few words, turned and left the apartment, still followed by her guards. Thus was the edifice of my brief dream of happiness dashed, broken to the ground of reality. The woman for whom I had offered my life, and for whose lips I had so recently heard a declaration of love for me, had lightly forgotten my very existence and smilingly given herself to the son of her people's most hated enemy. Okay, so this guy is not thinking the bigger picture. I mean, yeah, there's emotion involved, but really. Their, their alternative was not good. And, and he's saying, I will end this war if you wed my son. And she just wants to bring peace, right? She thinks John Carter is dead, and she wants to bring peace. So, stop crying, John Carter. Thark up. Although I had heard it with my own ears, I could not believe it. I must search out her apartments and force her to repeat the cruel truth to me alone before I would be convinced. And so I deserted my post and hastened through the passage behind the tapestries toward the door by which she had left the chamber. Slipping quietly through this opening, I discovered a maze of winding corridors, branching and turning in every direction. Running rapidly down first one and then another of them, I soon became hopelessly lost and was standing panting against a side wall when I heard voices near me. Apparently they were coming from the opposite side of the partition against which I leaned, and presently I made out the tones of Dejah Thoris. I could not hear the words, but I knew that I could not possibly be mistaken in the voice. Moving on a few steps, I discovered another passageway, at the end of which lay a door. 
Walking boldly forward, I pushed into the room only to find myself in a small antechamber in which were the four guards who had accompanied her. One of them instantly arose and accosted me, asking the nature of my business. I am from Thancosis, I replied, and wish to speak privately with Dejah Thoris, princess of Helium. And your order? asked the fellow. I did not know what he meant, but replied that I was a member of the guard, and without waiting for a reply from him, I strode toward the opposite door of the antechamber, behind which I could hear Dejah Thoris conversing. But my entrance was not to be so easily accomplished. The guardsman stepped before me, saying, no one comes from Thancosis without carrying an order on the password. You must give me one or the other before you may pass. The only order I require, my friend, to enter where I will, hangs at my side, I answered, tapping my longsword. Will you let me pass in peace or no? Fangwad says, yeah, Deja th should definitely realize that he's the main character and that nothing is capable of killing him. <laughs> also abandoning his post after 30 minutes. Good job. Yeah, right? Right? I'm like, yeah, no. You know what? He's John Carter, though. He's going to get her, like Conan, fling her over his shoulder, jump out a window, and then be off into the the desert on his way to helium with her thinking that he's you know rescuing her and being an idiot no i don't know i'm just guessing i'm ho i hope i'm kind of wrong about this for reply he whipped out his own sword calling to the others to join him and thus the four stood with drawn weapons barring my further progress you were not here by the order of Thancosis, cried the one who had first addressed me, and not only shall you not enter the apartments of the Princess of Helium, but you shall go back to Thancosis under guard to explain this unwarranted temerity. Throw down your sword, you cannot hope to overcome four of us, he added with a grim smile. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. My reply was a quick thrust which left me but three antagonists, and I can assure you that they were worthy of my medal. They had me backed against the wall in no time, fighting for my life. Slowly I worked my way to a corner of the room where I could force them to come at me only one at a time, and thus we fought upward of twenty minutes, the clanging of steel on steel producing a veritable bedlam in the little room. The noise had brought Dejah Thoris to the door of her apartment, and there she stood throughout the conflict with Sola at her back, peering over her shoulder. Her face was set and emotionless, and I knew that she did not recognize me, nor did Sola. Finally a lucky cut brought down a second guardsman, and then, with only two opposing me, I changed my tactics and rushed them down after the fashion of my fighting that had won me many a victory. The third fell within ten seconds after the second and the last lay dead upon the bloody floor a few moments later. They were brave men and noble fighters, and it grieved me that I had been forced to kill them, but I would have willingly depopulated all Barzoom, could I have reached the side of my Dejah Thoris in no other way. I killed four men because I just wanted to be with her. If that ain't love, I don't know what is. Sheathing my bloody blade. Sheathing my bloody blade. He doesn't even wipe it off. What warrior does that? I advanced toward my Martian princess, who still stood mutely gazing at me without sign of recognition. Who are you, Zodongan? she whispered, another enemy to harass me in my misery. I am a friend, I answered, a once cherished friend. No friend of Helium's princess wears that medal, she replied, and yet the voice. I have heard it before. It is not... It cannot be. No, for he is dead. It is, though my princess, none other than John Carter, I said.
Do you not recognize, even through paint and strange metal, the heart of your chieftain? As I came close to her, she swayed toward me with outstretched hands, but as I reached to take her in my arms, she drew back with a shudder and a little moan of misery. Too late, too late, she grieved. Oh, my chieftain, that was, and whom I thought dead, had you but returned one little hour before, but now it is too late, too late. What do you mean, Dejah Thoris, I cried, that you would not have promised yourself to the Zodagan prince had you known that I lived? Think you, John Carter, that I would give my heart to you yesterday and today to another? I thought it that it lay buried with your ashes in the pits of Warhoon, and so today I have promised my body to another to save my people from the curse of a Victoria Zodangan army. But I am not dead, my princess. I have come to claim you, and all Zodanga cannot prevent it. It is too late, John Carter. My promise is given, and on Barzoom that is final. The ceremonies which follow later are but meaningless formalities. They make the fact of marriage no more certain than does the funeral cortege of a Jeddak, again place the seal of death upon him. I am no good as Mary I am as good as Mary, John Carter. No longer may you call me your princess, no longer are you my chieftain. I know but little of your customs here upon Barsoom Deja Thoris. <laughs> Brush guy. The end. The end. That's it. That's you know what? That would make a good end, though. That would make a good end. <laughs> like just Jan. Sorry, pal. You're late. I thought you were dead. The end. I know but little of your customs here upon Barzoom, Dejah Thoris, but I do know that I love you, and if you meant the last words you spoke to me, that day, as the hordes of Warhoon were charging down upon us, no other man shall ever claim you as his bride. You meant them then, my princess, and you mean them still. Say that it can be, that it is true. I meant them, John Carter, she whispered. I cannot repeat them now, for I have given myself to another. Ah, if you had only known our ways, my friend, she continued, half to herself, the promise would have been yours long months ago and you could have claimed me before all others. It might have meant the fall of Helium, but I would have given my empire for my Tharkian chief. Then aloud she said, Do you remember the night when you offended me? You called me your princess without having asked my hand of me. And then you boasted that you had fought for me. You did not know, and I should not have been offended. I see that now. But there was no one to tell you. What I could not, that upon Barsoom there are two kinds of women in the cities of the Red Men, the ones they fight for, that they may ask them in marriage, but the other kind they fight for also, but never ask their hands. When a man is one a woman, he may address her as his princess, or in any of the several terms which signify possession. You had fought for me, but had never asked me in marriage. And so when you called me your princess, you see, she faltered, I was hurt. But even then, John Carter, I did not repulse you, as I should have done, until you made it doubly worse by taunting me with having won me through combat. I do not need ask your forgiveness now, Dejah Thoris, I cried. You must know that my fault was of ignorance of your Barsoomian customs. What I failed to do through implicit belief that my petition would be presumptuous and unwelcome, I do know. Dejah Thoris, I ask you to be my wife, and by all the Virginian fighting blood that flows in my veins, you shall be. No, John Carter. It is useless, she cried hopelessly. I may never be yours while Sabthan lives. You have sealed his death warrant, my princess. Sabthan dies. Nor that either, she hastened to explain. I may not wed the man who slays my husband, even in self-defense. It is custom. We are ruled by custom upon Barsoom. It is useless, my friend. You must bear the sorrow with me. That at least we may share in common. That and the memory of the brief days among the Tharks. You must go now, nor ever see me again. Goodbye, my chieftain that was. Disheartened and dejected, I withdrew from the room. 
but I was not entirely discouraged, nor would I admit that Dejah Thoris was lost to me until the ceremony had actually been performed. As I wandered along the corridors, I was absolutely lost in the mazes of winding passageways, as I had been before I discovered Dejah Thoris's apartments. I knew that my only hope lay in escape from the city of Zodanga, for the matter of the four dead guardsmen would have to be explained, and as I could never reach my original post without a guide, suspicion would surely rest on me, so soon as I was discovered wandering aimlessly through the palace. Presently I came upon a spiral runway leading to a lower floor, and this I followed downward for several stories, until I reached a doorway of a large apartment in which were a number of guardsmen. The walls of this room were hung with transparent tapestries, behind which I secreted myself without being apprehended. The conversation of the guardsmen was general, and awakened no interest in me until an officer entered the room and ordered four of the men to relieve the detail who were guarding the Princess of Helium. Now I knew my troubles would commence in earnest, and indeed they were upon me all too soon, for it seemed that the squad had scarcely left the guardroom before one of their number burst in again breathlessly, crying that they had found their four comrades butchered in the antechamber. In a moment the entire palace was alive with people. Guardsmen, officers, courtiers, servants, and slaves ran helter-skelter through the corridors and apartments, carrying messages and orders and searching for signs of the assassin. This was my opportunity, as slim as it appeared I grasped it, for as a number of soldiers came hurrying past my hiding place I fell in behind them and followed through the mazes of the palace until in passing through a great hall I saw the blessed light of day coming in through a series of larger windows. Here I left my guides and slipping to the nearest window sought for an avenue of escape. The windows opened upon a great balcony which overlooked one of the broad avenues of Zodanga. The ground was about thirty feet below, and at a like distance from the building was a wall fully twenty feet high, constructed of polished glass about a foot in thickness. To a red Martian, escape by this path would have appeared impossible, but to me, with my earthly strength and agility, it seemed already accomplished. My only fear was in being detected before darkness fell, for I could not make the leap in broad daylight while the court below and the avenue beyond were crowded with Zodangans. Accordingly, I searched for a hiding place and finally found one by accident, inside a huge hanging ornament which swung from the ceiling of the hall and about ten feet from the floor. Into the capacious bowl-like vase I sprang with ease, and scarcely had I settled down within it then I heard a number of people enter the apartment. The group stopped beneath my hiding place, and I could plainly overhear their every word. It is the work of Heliumite, said one of the men. Yes, O Jeddak, but how could they access to the palace? I could believe that even with the diligent care of your guardsmen a single enemy might reach the inner chambers, but how could a force of six or eight fighting men could have done so unobserved is beyond me. We shall soon know, however, for here comes the royal psychologist. Another man now joined the group, and after making his formal greetings to his ruler, said, O oh, mighty Jeddak, it is a strange tale I read in the dead minds of your faithful guardsmen. They were felled not by a number of fighting men, but by a single opponent. He paused to let the full weight of this announcement impress his hearers, and that his statement was scarcely credited was evidenced by the impatient exclamation of incredulity which escaped the lips of Thancosis. "'What manner of weird tale are you bringing me, Notan?' he cried. "'It is the truth, my Jeddak," replied the psychologist. "'In fact, the impressions were strong, strongly marked upon the brain of each of the four guardsmen.' "'Speak with dead,' that's what he did. He cast speak with dead. Their antagonist was a very tall man, wearing the medal of one of your own guardsmen, and his fighting ability was little short of marvelous, for he fought fair against the entire four and vanquished them by his surpassing skill and superhuman strength and endurance. Though he wore the medal of Zodanga, my Jeddak, such a man was never seen before in this or any other country upon Barzoom. 
The mind of the Princess of Helium, whom I have examined and questioned, was a blank to me. She has perfect control, and I could not read one iota of it. She said that she witnessed a portion of the encounter, and that when she looked there was but one man engaged with the guardsman, a man whom she did not recognize as ever having seen. "'Where is my erstwhile savior? spoke another of the party, and I recognized the voice of the cousin of Than Kosis, whom I rescued from the green warriors. By the metal of my first ancestor, he went on, but the description fits him to perfection, especially as to his fighting ability.' We have, we have cast in sleep on real brush guy. The spell has worked. He is sleepy. Good night, brush guy. Schlaf gut. Bangwad says, Black background check sounding like a good idea now, huh, cousin? Yeah. But he saved my life. Where is this man? cried Thancosis. Have him brought to me at once. What know you of him, cousin? It seems strange to me, now that I think upon it, that there should have been such a fighting man in Zodanga, of whose name even we were ignorant before today. And his name, too, John Carter. Who ever heard of such a name upon Barsoom? Word was soon brought that I was nowhere to be found, either in the palace or at my former quarters in the barracks of the Air Scout Squadron. Kantos Khan they had found in question, but he knew nothing of my whereabouts, and as to my past, he had told them he knew as little, since he had but recently met me during our captivity among the Warhoons. Keep your eyes on this other one, commanded Than Kosis. He also is a stranger, and likely as not they both hail from Helium, and where one is we shall sooner or later find the other. Quadruple the air patrol, and let every man who leaves the city by air or ground be subjected to the closest scrutiny. Another messenger now entered with word that I was still within the palace walls. The likeness of every person who has entered or left the palace grounds today has been carefully examined, concluded the fellow, and not one approaches the likeness of this new padoir of the guards, other than that which was recorded of him at the time he entered. And we will have him shortly, commented Thankosis, contentedly, and in the meanwhile we will repair to the apartments of the Princess of Helium and question her in regard to the affair. She may know more than she cared to divulge to you, Notan. Come. They left the hall, and as darkness had fallen without, I slipped lightly from my hiding place and hastened to the balcony. Few were in sight, and choosing a moment when none seemed near, I sprang quickly to the top of the glass wall and from there to the avenue beyond the palace grounds. So, he's gone. He's left the citadel. And that's the end of the chapter. Next Friday, we'll be reading chapter 23. 23 Lost in the Sky. But we're calling it today because it's five. If I had been closer to the end of the book, I would keep going. But I'm not. I, I still have like one quarter of the book to go. So we can probably finish that next Friday. So thanks for thanks for hanging out and and listening to the reading stream, the Friday reading stream. Thanks, Fangwad. You have a good weekend too. I hope everybody has a happy Friday and a good weekend. Hey Carrie Michael Cosby, how are you? I am just wrapping it up. Uh, and Sunday night as a reminder. 
my podcast with my friends Gonzo and John O is right here on More Than Dice. We are we are More Than Dice. And we will be talking about all kinds of geeky things from tabletop wargaming to painting miniatures to the movies and TV shows that we've been watching. And hopefully I see you there. That starts at 6.30 p.m. Central every Sunday night. And then Tuesday, I go back to miniature painting again at 3 p.m. I will see you all next time. Have a good night.